got tighter and tighter and the roles got more constricted. So, you know, in the very beginning of any project, even if you have rules and the art director is telling you what they need, usually there's a lot of room for creative exploration in the very beginning. And that's actually the most fun of almost any project is the very beginning phase of it because, um, you know, even though if there's something super nailed down, um, what it may look like can vary drastically and they want a lot of options, you know, so that they can make the best choice. And so your brain can just really run, run wild, you know. Um, the only downside on that and other different jobs is when there's a tight deadline or it's a very small gig and they don't have a lot of um, money, let's say, to, you know, mess around with a lot of ideas, then, you know, you have to really just listen, you know, listen really carefully and, you know, to minimize revisions and, uh, and just give them exactly what they want. And that's fine too, you know, um, that happens. And that's also can be very creative. It's just not as um, exploratory, you know. So, I think that's one reason I like. Uh, I, I think it's the the people that do like League of Legends their style because like the people that do the illustrations for that. Like I've seen like th there is no like specific style for them. I mean, as long as you nail the characters correctly, like the uh, like I've seen like one piece that was like almost like kind of anime esque or whatever, but it was like. They had like a very like realistic cell shade look to it, and then I've seen some that are like super rendered stuff that are like look straight real, and I I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's. Well, I I actually worked for the League of Legends um, years ago when they were first just starting out. It was you know it's an isometric game, so they they wanted uh, these two or these uh, horizontal illustrations of different parts of the world, and so I did like a uh, I think five or six different concept pieces, and. Um, and they were very open to what things could look like. They just gave me a basic paragraph. Um, I think they gave me like a photograph of a place in, on Earth that it should look similar to, and but make it more uh, fantasy. And and I just went to town, and that was so much fun because you know I was getting paid a lot of money to do one just core piece that would uh, anchor down this location, like as if you were actually sitting in the environment looking out. And um, I think that really helped, um, I mean, the players in a sense because they could get a, a feeling of what it would be like to walk around in that world. You know, I, I mean, isometric games are really fun to play, but, um, but visually uh, they're not very immersive to me just because you don't feel like you're really inside the, the world. You're just more looking bird's eye, which I understand. That's the whole concept. But, uh, but when, a, when, a, when a client from that platform wants you to get in there and really explore what it, what it could look like from the from the ground up and that's a lot of fun kind of like the difference between playing something like Diablo and like Skyrim where Skyrim's like first person and you're running around and it's more of like open world than like I don't know when you're looking down bird's eye view it's kind of a uh, flat exactly and I think so I don't play World of Warcraft but I I've seen it I think you can go from isometric to horizontal view slightly right if you zoom in yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best use of, of uh, you know, those massively multiplayer online games is when you can do both. Um, but yeah, League of Legends, uh, it's interesting. Their style is just so crazy. It's all over the place, but it works, and they're highly successful. So they must be doing something right. But they're, 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 they are breaking like every rule, you know, in terms of of just a strong art-directed style. I mean, I guess it all kind of looks like it's from the same world, but I don't know. It's, it's the same time, not really. No, but not really, yeah. So, I mean, maybe that's more believable because in real life, everything's different, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, nothing well, is... From what I understand, like, Magic the Gathering actually used to be like that, but now they've kind of, like, really hammered, like... I. I've talked to a couple people who used to work for them, and they said, like, back in the beginning, they'd be like, paint a troll, you know, just like your own version of a troll, and then, like, now it's like, this character looks this specific way, doing this specific thing against this specific character, you know, and it's, I don't know, it gets a little, gets a little crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so working for different clients, you know, especially freelance, you're going to be tasked with, with uh, all kinds of different uh, jobs, and you know, you just kind of have to take take each job as it comes. And 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 the great part, actually, of working freelance is, you know, the human relation component of it. As isolated as it is, 
I think is a good thing because uh, on the downside, I, I used to work at a major major studios, and you know you you'd have some great camaraderie with your with your art friends and colleagues working next to each other and getting advice and you know playing um, Nintendo DS for five minutes at a time and uh, you know all these different little games we used to play with each other. But then um, you know the other part is if you work in that environment and someone bugs you a lot or you know, the energy with a particular person is kind of just annoying you, you know, but they're, like, literally work right next to you. I've only had that happen, like, one other time. Um, it, it can be very stressful, and you got to go to work every day with this person. I think every single person can relate to this. When you work freelance, you don't have to deal with that person on the phone for, like, you know, half hour phone call or whatever, and, and when, you hang, when you hang up the phone, you're done. And, and you don't have them checking over your shoulder, you know, you, you show the work when you're ready. I mean, when you're when you're in a studio, you'll notice you'll have your headphones on, you'll be deep into work, and you get a tap on the shoulder, and you turn around, and it's someone, you know, that might have, you know, art director might have gone to the bathroom or something, and he, he just wants to see how you're doing. And your, your, your piece might not be ready yet, you know, you might not even you'd be halfway there, and you're already getting, you know, some feedback on something that you're, you're not prepared to show yet. So... You know, that's the you downside. Be when you're in the zone, too, which could... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And good art directors won't do that. I mean, really good art directors know, hey, look, I'm going to leave this guy alone. He's going to show me when he's ready. But then you sometimes get art directors, you know, that maybe are not artists, and that happens a lot. And, and you know, they just want to, you know, uh, push their... Instant gratification. Yeah, you know, I'm art director. <laughs> I'm, you know, how are you doing, you know? And I'll, I'll show you when I'm ready, you know? So, I mean... It can all vary, you know, but but freelance just really affords you the the, the time to to sh you know be the presenter and be able to you know show it when you're when you're set and ready and get your ducks in a row and uh, and again you know if you, if you deal with someone that's not very um, pleasant you know it's not very it's 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 infrequent and that's good <laughs> so um, I'm sorry you broke up there uh, say again. Uh, um, are you still getting it? Yeah, I think it actually Hold on, hold on. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Any better? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, I was just going to say that, especially with like all these studios closing down now, like it's, I feel like freelance is also a more viable thing for, uh, or just option for, you know, people who are trying to pursue art and such. Like it's plus you can pick and choose your own projects and you won't be hammered down into like one particular place, which I think is almost a necessity for a creative person is to not get into like a specific routine. I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the, the you get kind of stale sometimes if you're working at a major studio. You you get really comfortable with coming in each day and, and having a set amount of work that's already prepared for you and you know, you just turn off your marketing hat and you just come in. You're kind of like a drone, and that's fine. And that's and you know that you can just you're focusing on the art all the time, and that's that's really good. Um, the downside is sometimes you can be blindsided and you know you lose your job, <laughs> and then what do you do? You know, especially if you don't have much savings or something like that, then you're going to be in a position of of panic. I mean, now freelance. There's sometimes you get pretty panicky too. You know, you can go sometimes. I've got the longest I've ever gone without work, and this is many years ago. Was two months, and you know, I started like tapping my desk, like, "Come on, <laughs> let's get uh, let's get some assignments going here." You know, but then you learn that any, those those periods are are blessings now, where I can either focus on my own work or or promote my work. You know, I if I have a week that's that's like down. Because I may be in between jobs, and that the or or maybe I'm just finished with the job. And I don't have one lined up yet. That full week, I can, I know I can poke and prod around with all my contacts. And I'm, I can find someone that needs, you know, a couple months of work or a couple weeks of work. So, um, you know, that's another thing. You work freelance long enough, and you're going to end up having a gigantic connection base that will kind of save you. So, um, you know, it's good to have colleagues. Yeah, good to have to keep stacking. Sorry? Uh, I was just saying, like, I imagine it just keeps kind of stacking the more and more you do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
Anyway, uh, can you guys see my monitor? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Are we, we going to see if you'd be willing to, I guess, cut to the to the demo? Um, yeah, I don't know. I was just. Do we want to still do that, or are we almost out of time? Or oh, no. we got plenty. We got all day. <laughs> all day. Yeah, cool. just till whenever till whenever you're you're good. <laughs> cool. Well, I was just gonna sketch something out here. Yeah, I can't see your monitor yet. It's still on a gray screen. Oh, it is. Okay, let me hold on. Yeah, go to the uh, screen share, and then uh, it should be like desktop or Photoshop. There we go. There we go. Okay. Cool. Awesome. It was actually before we get into too like much uh, like before we get into the crazy technical information. Or whatever, like there was something I was gonna ask you like in regards to your personal work, like you were talking about a second ago. It was the uh, like when you created Fantastical, which is like basically like your own IP because it's you know the art of Matt Gazer, you know it's your, it's your own book. The what steps did you take to kind of like you know make sure you didn't like get, get, kind of get hamstringed on it, like you know where someone could like you could like lose the rights to it or anything like that? Um, well, I googled Fantastical and not a lot came up, and um, the stuff that did was just either had fantastical used in a different way or if it was a single singular title it didn't have my name on it so by you know fantastical the artomat gazer i knew that i i was pretty safe cuz i was i was blending my name my art with that name mm -hmm. uh, and so i i rolled with it and and i, I think and my wife actually came up with the name uh, i was i was coming up with some really lame stupid <laughs> titles and she's like you always you know, explain your work as fantastical or whimsical, and so I was like, oh yeah, just fantastical. So we, we went with that. I ended up doing a um, a painting specifically for the cover, and um, based on some of my experience with Battle Milk uh, and just some feedback I got from some other uh, book designer friends of mine, you know, when you're designing a cover for a book, you want it to be really uh, immersive and just have a lot of depth. You know, you want to like kind of bring people into this world that you're trying to convey. Uh, you know, the Dinotopia books do that really well. They're just really, really um, immersive. So I, I, I wanted to do something that was, you know, fantastical, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and so I did that. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the uh, the IP I would say is all encompassing of just my personal work and what that what that entails. So it's just this. So these worlds that I've created over the years are all packaged into one book, and they're the, all these worlds are kind of from the same universe, um, you know. So the stories inside are very um, uh, similar, but but the the you know the narratives are very different. I guess the worlds are similar. You know, there's giants, there's um, you know this combination of science fiction meets whimsical fantasy, like you'd see in Harry Potter or you know, and then there's this medieval tone in some of the some areas of these worlds where it's it's very Lord of the Rings but sci-fi-ish. You know, so I like I love this combination of like castles, but then they maybe have like these crazy ion solar energy cells that you know keep the lights on at night. Uh, that concept just really interests me, and I want to explore it more down the road. Um, you know, in some movies in the '80s, kind of uh, like Krull, they had this good cross blend of science fiction and medieval fantasy and I just I just think that's that's an area that I think film just hasn't explored a whole lot with you know yeah um, definitely not recent times you know like you've got um, you know medieval knights on horseback but then they're carrying some laser cannon you know I mean that <laughs> I mean that, you know but it's all designed in a way that looks like it's from the same world you know I, I just think you know maybe there's some weird robots that are kind of helping them too um, you know, I, anyway, that, yeah, so, so when you start piecing together a universe like that, um, a million ideas come to mind, and, and stories do too, and so over the years I've just decided to package them into this one book, you know, I, and I, a lot of those stories are based on projects that start off really strong, uh, with some help of friends, and, and then they ended up, uh, fizzling out because we got really busy, or, or, you know, the opportunity fell through, and instead of just putting it on the shelf forever, I thought it was just important to maybe publish it so, you know, share it with the rest of the world. So, yeah, I, mean, I mean, it might inspire somebody at the end of the day to, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I, 
uh, and with a, with a with a lot of luck, you know, you never know. Maybe a producer might grab it and and see the interest in it, and uh, and you know, movies have been made on less than that. So all it takes is yeah. is someone with an idea, and then they get a, a screenwriter, and and the rest is history. Uh, uh, not really, because there's a lot more to it. But but to get a project started, you know, that's what sometimes that's all it takes. So. Um, so yeah, I, another piece of advice, I guess, is if you're inventing your own universe and your own worlds, uh, don't be afraid to share it. I've never been afraid to post my work and try and get it published in magazines or uh, put it up on on the web. Um, you know, everyone's like, "Oh, I'm I'm so afraid someone's gonna steal my idea." You know, well, well, I honestly, if you if they copy it, that's the best flattery. As long as you can prove that you came up with that first, you're fine. So, um, and the more material you have of that universe that you're trying to create, if someone tries to rip it off, there's there's more evidence that it came from you. So think of it that way, too. Plus, if they copy it, then it's like, I don't know, it, it, even if they did copy it and try to like come up with something with it, it's not going to be the same as what you have. So your idea will still retain that originality where their ripoff probably won't be quite as uh, close to what your, I don't yeah. know, anywhere near what your vision was for it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean... Yeah, so I mean, I you know, I've met a lot of people. Oh, I've got this idea, you know, but I just don't want to share it with anybody. And I'm like, well, just tell me. I'm so excited. It sounds awesome, you know. And they're like, oh, when I publish it one day, I'll you'll see everything. And I'm like, well, guess I'll never see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not gonna wait all day. You know, come on, show me your work. So, you know, um, and inspiring each other is is what it's all about. So. Definitely. So, uh, what are you doing here? So, I'm um, I'm just creating an environment, and I'm uh, using sort of basic block shapes to just kind of get me started. And I don't know what they are quite yet. I, I'm I'm kind of thinking this is more of like a ruined uh, city kind of thing, but maybe there was some technology involved at one time. And um, I'm just kind of setting up my composition really fast here, so I can actually get to painting. Because I, I think we wanted to focus on limited color palettes today, so I'm just going to try and race through a quick sketch here so I can actually focus on lighting and color. Is, uh, is this like how you would normally like start a piece like this, just like with a sketch, or do you sometimes just kind of throw a paint in there? I always like to have some kind of grayscale drawing just as a base, and it may not uh, end up looking at all like what I initially sketch. And the final piece, but it's just something to just kind of start with is always really good for me. Just to kind of get you going. Yeah. So. So is this kind of like a variation of like the uh, I've heard of the the chaos to control method where you know you kind of just like come out like you have like an abstract idea, start throwing stuff down, and like just figure it out from there. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm really interested in, in just graphic shapes as an environment. That's just something I, I pull from in my own work a lot. And since, you know, I'm working quickly here, I'm just kind of, you know, not trying to reinvent the wheel and uh, going with with just shapes that interest me, have always interested me, and uh, and trying to build, a you know, an environment, a location based on that. Um, I, I, there's a great book. I wish my camera was working. It's called The Lost Cities of the Mayas. I actually picked it up when I was at Chichen Itza at their museum. And um, some amazing uh, lithographs and paintings of these guys way back in the 18th century that um, went out to Mayan ruins and did these, these incredible paintings because back in the day they didn't have any photographs of these areas. So artists would go out and sketch and, and do these, these paintings to show people what, what these locations really looked like. Um, I, I've always been inspired by by that kind of stuff. These just, you know, incredible ruins and you know Indiana Jones kind of things. So uh, I will we'll try and illustrate that to some degree today, right, with luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's always about luck. Okay, so from a little more dark line here in the foreground. You're just like having. I'm sorry, you broke up. What? What's that? Hold on, I think I'm going a little bit. Yeah, I think you just got to get extra. Alright, 
Is that yes. better? Yeah. I can tell you, it's just. Uh, what, I was, what, what was ask, I, I was gonna ask if you ever just like have a bad day, and like you know, is there is there ever like a time where you're just like, man, nothing is working out for me today. Like, what is this? Oh yeah, in those days I don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do, but... Uh, Some people are just like, you know, I power through it or whatever, but, like, I, I don't know if it's, like, more important, especially, like, when you're not, just not feeling it at that time, like, if it's more important to just set it down and walk away and then, you know, come back, like, I don't know, maybe even just, like, for an hour or something, you know, and not think about it. Or... Yeah, it's always good to take mini breaks all the time. Even if you're having a good day, um, you'll come back and stay fresh, you know, and uh, get a new perspective on your work that you, know, you may not have had moments later earlier. I know some people like to juggle like a couple pieces at a time to kind of do that. That way they're still painting, but like you know they have to think a little differently for each one. Oh yeah, I mean like here I'll show you really quick. Um, I've been working on this layout for God I don't know when. Hold on, Let's see, bear with me here um, to make it fun. I'll put there you go. Let's see, where was that painting ideas? So that's like a layout I've been working on for a painting. I, I, I haven't had the the inspiration enough to actually finish it as a as a color piece, but the idea is there, you know, this giant just playing a a, a massive um, instrument and the this gal is being shepherded into this realm with these weird creature people and there's waterfalls and mist and little peacock type creatures you know I, I just want this to be a very beautiful mystical early morning sort of experience and uh, I, I just haven't found the right mood in my brain uh, or you know inspiration to really complete it but um, anyway I've had that sketch for like a couple years now <laughs> so um, so yeah I mean you, you may have the right amount of uh, the right idea but you know, the inspiration may not quite hit you to complete it, so. That makes a lot okay. of sense. Alrighty, so usually at this point I will multiply, multiply a new layer. Another thing I like to do is lighten my uh, sketch a little more and actually color it, so um, add some color right off the bat with the sketch. And uh, when we're talking about, you know, limited color palettes, maybe, you know, the colors that you're thinking in your mind, you might want to kind of emulate with the, the color of the sketch, and that will get you off on the right start, too. Um, I'm thinking kind of like pinkish reds. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of picturing that this material on these buildings is very brick or mortar-oriented. So... Um, Another thing I like to do is just throw some gradient darker tones right away. It's big painting your light source here. Yeah. Gotcha. I think what you're doing like right now what like a lot of masters did. Uh, like when they first started painting was like they literally would go over their entire canvas with like a particular just one particular tone real quick. That way they can set an atmosphere or move for it. Exactly. exactly. And then from here you want to block in all your lights and all your darks, so I mean, obviously, in the foreground, we're going to go, sh you know, sort of a shadowy area here. I like to color pick from within the painting so, uh, in the beginning. So I'm just using colors that already, I'm already starting to establish. So I've been using this in a lot of like landscape paintings. Um, um, like the the foreground will like it'll be like three major sections. Like the the foreground will usually like be darker, and then there'll be like a middle tone area, and then there'll be like an even lighter area further away. Like as it gets closer to the light source, is is that like common like in your strategy? Oh, like, like drop a major shadow in the foreground. Yeah, I, I mean, it, what it does is it, it just focuses your, your, um, you know, your, uh, 
your focal point, unless your focal point's directly in the front, then obviously that changes everything. But if like right now I feel like my focal point is this this pillar in the in the middle middle ground here. Um, you know, to bring more focus on that, you just drop the, the foreground the mid the super foreground into shadow. And what's cool about that too is you know if you want to add like a character later on, you know, he's standing right here with his sombrero and you know staff or something. I mean he he'll stand out as a silhouette because he's already dropped in shadow. And that's really easy to convey in a concept if you just need something for scale, you know. So um but then you can also do the reverse. You could also have him in, in, in complete light and have everything else in shadow. Um, if, if we had more time, I would reverse everything and do that, but let's just try and... I actually kind of felt like your focal point was like the door <laughs> because, like, I mean, the the pillar in the front and then the pillar in the back a little bit are kind of the repetitive shape. I forgot I even drew that, so I didn't see it. You're right. <laughs> Because, because of the repetitive shape, it was like bounce from the one in the front to the one in the back, and then it's like, especially with the character, it's like I feel like he's walking toward that door. So it was a, you're onto something there. So um, okay, so for real quick here, so I think what what I'll do is start throwing in some texture just to play around. Um, hold on, I have a a, a um, folder of just where is that folder uh, oh of just textures and they're they're random like I'll give you a few ideas like one is uh, like a granite but it's got a lot of different variation in there and you can play around with different colors uh, another one's a screenshot from a movie but it's like random um, I think this is a texture from an artist's painting. I mean, what, what you can do with this is just throw it in here. I think this artist is well known, so I apologize if I'm using your art. I won't be using it in a way that will influence It's just to show texture. Um, so, let's see. I guess that's a good way to kind of start introducing other hues and stuff, like, really quickly. Yeah. Just get some free, uh, free, I guess, textures, yeah. Yeah, uh, just more busyness, I guess. Um. Yeah, and so I guess you could just start plucking, like now that you have all those colors on there, you can just start going to town and building this thing. Yeah, exactly. And let's see, let me just... Hold on. Yeah, and then um, you know maybe we can get in some cloud texture in the background really fast. So we'll grab. I mean, a lot of artists do this, especially if you're working fast. You know, you're gonna you're gonna just use what you can. Although, let's let's paint instead. Let's see. So another brush I like to use is the uh, the wet media brush. There's um, I think it's 54 here. You go to your brushes, shape dynamics, and pressure on, transfer on. And what it does is, um, is it gives you like this stringy sort of textural tone that's very painterly. Do you use a lot of the uh... Like, do you have like a couple primary brushes that you mostly stick to, or do you have like, you know, do you kind of like have a? Variety? I do, and and I'm not the type to create new brushes either. I just use kind of stock what I what they what they have, mm. what Photoshop comes with. I mean, so. Um, is this uh, brush here? Is this a default uh, default brush, or is this one that you found? This is one I found. Uh, it, I mean, no, it's it's default. Sorry. So if you okay. go to wet, wet, wet media brushes. Gotcha. Yeah, and it's um, let's see, cancel. I think it's 54. Just just these these dotty like weird uh, brushes. They they just give you this nice stringy look. It has a pretty nice texture to it. Yeah, I like. I enjoy it. 
So are you on a, a normal layer right now, or are you on a like a multiple? I'm on a multiply layer right now. Yeah, so, uh, so, I felt like uh, lazy. I like that look. <laughs> yeah. So like with with this, so we're dealing with um, you know a, a, a painting that is is mostly pink or pinkish purple, and my brain when I'm in that tone, just you know like an ultramarine blue would not work for me. So something that's maybe more cyan or uh, turquoise would be a nice complementary tone, and and even though it's uh, a different color, it it just it fits with the pink for some reason. I can't explain this. This is just something, you know. When I'm working, I I just have this 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 method of of picking colors that works out that way. But um, anyway, back to limited color palettes. So. Um, you kind of want to keep all your colors the same, but you want to have enough uniqueness where it's not, you know, boring either. So, you know, colors that are within that range, you want to explore um, more. Personal. Something I was actually going to ask you was the uh, like because you started out the image like you know pretty as a basically as a warm image in itself, and then like I don't know you you were talking about how like you, your your color uh, picking kind of shifts to a um, well, your natural method of color picking, it was like, I don't know, you immediately chose like a contrast, like for that, it was like you said like a turquoise or, you know, purple or something to kind of cool the image off. Yeah, and you, you, you know, you, we'll explore changing that maybe down the road. I mean, you just go through these variations of, of just trying to figure out what, what looks best. I'm sorry, sometimes it's hard for me to communicate while I paint. So, let me just... Uh, here, hold on. But you can keep talking. I'll I'll, I'll try to answer. <laughs> no, it's it's um, I totally understand. I think we all have that same issue. <laughs> hold on here. So let's work with some light. So I think it'd be really cool to have like a, the sun coming in and uh, and hitting this this pillar. Um, Getting some like really random color, like right by the where the sun hits it. Getting some tones that are a little warmer. So, so it'd be like um, sunlight then, since you're introducing a uh, like a yeah. more yellow. Yeah. And when when you were learning like color theory in of itself, was it like? more of like a trial and error process for you or did you kind of figure out like a more of a science behind it or was it just something you had to kind of experience as you went? That's a really good question. So I, I never got sciency about it ever and a lot of people do and that's good if that works for you. Um, me it's just a feeling, you know, I mean, you know, tertiary versus um, complementary and all that stuff. It's like, sure, you know, that that's, that's, that that's being put to use sometimes in my work, but uh, um, I don't think about it like that when I'm actually doing the painting. Um, usually, it's just uh, a collection of thoughts that are just I'm just trying to create mood, and you know, anything in the shadowy areas will be more um, more cooler, and based on the certain color you're using, um, yeah. that will. Uh, uh, James was a big. Uh, James Gurney was a big influence for you. Was it like was his color and light book specifically helpful with that? I just picked up. I just like a couple months ago picked up that book, and uh, and all I've done is look at the illustrations. <laughs> but I do, <laughs> I do plan to read it. I do. I, I mean, it's a it's a fabulous book, and he is the master at breaking down what's working in a painting or in a real environment uh, when it comes to um, light and shadow, and you know, fill light and bounce light and Cast light and all that stuff, of course shadows and so. I heard a lot of people really praise that book about like uh you know the like uh, understanding color usage and it's specifically like you know with the science behind it and everything like I've I've looked through it um I mean I have it but I haven't like gotten to the phase where I'm using it yet. Yeah, I I, I think at some point we all will. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's. The James Geary book, I gotta have it, you know. Uh, but uh, but there is, but there is some, you know. There's another reason we actually want to learn. So it's just taking the time to to digest everything. Sometimes takes a little while. 
especially if you're inundated with work or whatever. Okay, so all right, I've kind of created my own light source a little bit. Uh, I think my the idea of having this this stairway as the focal points going away, although we may change our mind. Um, and I'm realizing I don't want everything to be so freaking perfect in terms of like angular shapes. I want it to be very um, chiseled and destroyed, and things are are not all lined up all the time. And that's because I want the piece. You say it looks kind of like rustic, like it's decayed a little bit. Is kind of the feeling I've got, like looking at. So and um, and this is just. I mean, we are literally at the beginning phases of a painting. This is not anything to be proud of at all right now. I'm just trying to get convey mood and light and color um, and 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 dare I even say design because there really isn't much design going <laughs> on here. Um, but you know when you're starting out a piece and you don't know where it's going, that's kind of how it begins. And then as you progress you start figuring out the design and you start figuring out stuff like that. So um, as you can see, I've actually collapsed my layer completely. I'm in full background mode, and uh, I've just decided to abandon the sketch entirely because I don't need it anymore. Uh, so some other tricks I like to use when I'm painting is um, duplicate a flattened version of your file, and um, you actually darken that. And what you excuse me. Um, you, you have two versions. You have your light layer, you have your dark layer. And if your dark layer is on top, and you use the eraser tool, you can actually paint with light. So you can actually drop in all your areas that you want to be hit by sun. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> and, um, you can start. But what you're, what you're achieving is, is you're painting with light, and you're still, but you're still uh, maintaining all the values and different little nuances just by holding on to your light layer. Yeah, it's really uh, cool off those shadows an extra bit too, like doing the uh, the darker layer. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you think they're too cool, you can always warm them up or make them more purple or less saturated or more saturated. Um, that's the fun thing about playing with colors. You can really, at this phase, change three things. Um, okay, what I'm going to do now is play with Yeah, more. I found myself using the heat saturation, like, quite a bit. Like, sometimes, like, I'll be happy with color starting out, and then, like, I'll have to reevaluate, like, parts another, of it, and I'll just go into that and start looking around. Right. Um, another good thing that I recently learned was um, through my uh, buddy who actually built my computer. He's a photographer, and he was like, do you know about this? And I was like, what? Um, is that in Photoshop under filter, there is a uh, camera raw filter mode right here. So if you click that, and your computer's fast enough to open it, unlike mine, um, You have all these options to play around with color. You can play with the temperature, play with the tint. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I did not know about that. <laughs> did you guys know about this? No, no idea. <laughs> I knew that like they had something like this in Bridge, but like uh, this is way more advanced. Like, yeah, this is like crazy because you can like, oh man, I want to get that foggy effect. You know, you can go really. You can make things really eerie. You know? Yeah, that is awesome. So um, you can pump your blacks more, and it's really like it's really cheating. <laughs> but it, <laughs> but but it, it's not. I think because you still have to be an artist, you still have to figure out what looks good, and you still have to make sure to understand what you're doing. And yeah, you uh, still have to know the why behind. You know, like why why are you doing this? You know. Exactly. So. Um, so I think I'm gonna we're gonna go somewhere in this range. Okay. Boom. Now all of a sudden, I love where this is going because we've kind of knocked out all those strange cools that were kind of making the piece a little drab, and it's um 
it's getting happy again, and that's kind of where I was going with in the beginning. So I like that. Um, now what I like to do at this phase, since everything's so painterly and just loose, is I'll go back into the uh, just the round brush with a hard edge and actually start refining my edges and, and trying to figure out kind of what things look like. So essentially you're drawing as you paint now. And um, you can start exploring with like, you know, cables and weird things that might actually define either the technology or the culture or something that you're trying to create. Start kind of telling the story behind the piece. Get yeah. some character. Yeah. You know, like maybe there used to be like some roof up here. Somebody used to live up here or something. So that's like weird. I'm holding it together. And there's even a dude up there. Yes, they could be like the that little guy's like makeshift shelter or something. <laughs> Maybe, they, maybe these people have moved in here since things have been destroyed and they've kind of added on to it or something. Um, maybe it's part of a giant, a giant machine. These are vents. You know, you can go to town. And then maybe they have like a garden down here with like a fence or something. And we can explore like I love when I when you do a paint I love to get the viewer into the image and that's like I feel like we're still in this phase where you're separated even though this is sort of in the foreground it's not quite so I really want to try and push the viewer like into the image more so when, by doing that you want to you want to create a sense of like you're literally inside and sometimes to do that you need to take some risks and and really just like add something that that you know puts people into the scene. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah. like recently, yeah, recently. Like, um, um, I like um, having like having oh, 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 am I echoing? Yeah, you're getting an echo, man. Okay, is it is it still there? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay. Yeah, I was saying like um like I was doing an environment recently, and like a thing that I was trying to push is like having objects that like with the perspective of the picture, like they're they're hitting the ground but that part of the ground that they're hitting is not in the actual, like, picture frame. So it's, like, jutting out. Like, almost like when you see, like, in a 3D movie or something, like, when they'll have, like, an object that's, like, you can't see where it's hitting the ground, but it's, like, floating in your face, kind of, like, it kind of puts you in that scene. Exactly. Yeah, then that, that's exactly what I sort of i am starting to try to do is something like that. Um, one thing I'm kind of noticing, though, is, like, in my, in my composition... You know, everything's kind of doing the same thing. Like, everything's going this way, you know, and everything's kind of going this way. I mean, and so you want to try and create something that's doing the opposite. Like, almost like... Kind of break up the linearity of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe there's like a... some kind of structure here that's doing something a little more dramatic. Um, but I assume these are your favorite kind of illustrations to do, or more the like big open scene kind of. Uh... They are because you you feel like your world, you feel like God. You you know you're just inventing this this space and and um, I mean, you know, I, when I'm doing um, narrative illustration, I get very intimate. You know, it's like it's it's more about the characters and what they're doing in the scene, like if they're by a campfire or something. Like I'm illustrating my so my I got a book project in the works with with Chronicle Books right now, and it's been this uh, adventure series that um, we've been developing for I think a good three to four years now, and it's based on a story of mine. And um, you know, I've got a writer; uh, she's incredibly talented, and uh, and we we jam together, and she does these amazing. Uh, you know, narrative pieces, and then I'm illustrating them, and uh, I'm I'm realizing it's just, it's not concept art. I mean, you're really trying to tell a story, so you have to be very literal about how you you know you you design stuff. It's like you can't just have fun and just invent this world. You have to 
figure out the composition of the characters, where they fit in, and um, and then you know you can have fun with the background, maybe you know where they are, um, you know, and obviously in in some pieces uh, there's that moment where you can do an establishing shot, you know, and you get you get really jazzed about that, but um, but yeah, when when you're doing a, a legit legitimate um, you know book that's illustrated, it, it's it's got to support the story, so you just can't go crazy. Yeah, you gotta think about like the why the environment is this way. Like, how did it get to this place? You know, what's the function behind it? What's the purpose of why the characters are here? You know, things of that nature. Exactly. Yeah, there's there's one piece that I actually used it for our event banner for this that I really like. That kind of is is similar in Spain. Like you had like this um this girl. I think it was like a parasol, and she's in a field, and there's this crazy like floating mech like balloon thing like hovering above her. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know that exactly. I've got a lot of mileage from that guy. That's called his name is um Primrob. And uh yeah the the story behind him is that he was imprisoned uh in a in a in a natural prison glade for a crime he didn't commit. And so that, that gal that's in the uh field is uh feeling sorry for him because he's been framed and so she brings him like cookies you know and uh, what's funny is, you know, I came up with the story as I was painting it, and uh, and I felt bad for the guy, and so I gave him tears, you know. If you look really closely, like, he's kind of crying. And uh, I think I had lost my cat at the time, so it was kind of, I must have been projecting my sorrow <laughs> into the piece yeah, or something. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but that, I mean, that, that's, a you know, an example of, of, of an illustration that, which, you know, wasn't all over the place. It was more focused on the character, and obviously the, the environment was very fantastical around him. But you know, as, as yeah, I was gonna say like it was very like warm and pleasant, but like he was so like somber and sad. Like it, it, like there wasn't like a contrasting color element, but like he was his emotion was the contrast element because everything around him was very yeah. whimsical and pretty and, like, and brightly lit, but then still sad. Yeah, and I like that because it, it it's like such a contrast, like. What the heck is this guy doing, chained to a stump in the middle of this beautiful location? <laughs> well, if you think about it, the way he was designed, he doesn't have any. His hands are too short, shorter than his his um his bulbous body. So there's no way for him to really unchain himself. And maybe the girl that brings him cookies is too afraid to release him because you know she might be killed or he doesn't know why. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Those are. Contrasts are like really, really great. Like it's, it's kind of silly example, but like I saw a piece of that recently where it's a, uh, you know what that the grumpy cat is, like the, uh, there's like this cat with this ridiculous like mad face, and uh, they someone painted that cat, where like Ariel uh, comes up and Little Mermaid comes up out of the ocean, you know, singing part of your world. Yeah. It's just like right. it's just a completely happy environment. And he even put like he even put the hair of Ariel on the cat, and the cat just looks mad. So it's like, <laughs> I mean, it, it makes him stand out that much more because like the environment and the piece just looks so bright and happy, and he just looks so angry. Oh, it's, yeah. I mean, and see that that works. It, it's it's you know, when you start bringing in, um, con it's all about contrast. Even when you're you know narratively, or you know, if you're dealing with with lighting or you know, it's it's just a, trying to make make the piece more more uh, more engaging, and yeah. and way of doing that is just to is to just put things that are just a position from each other that should normally be there. So uh, I, I completely agree. It's like I don't know. So sometimes you actually see like a lot of movies do that kind of thing where it's like a movie that is stuck in one particular kind of like atmosphere with only one mode. Like, it drags you down after a while, and you just, like, I don't know, it makes you feel sluggish rather than actually enjoy the experience that it's trying to offer, you know, because there's no contrast. Yeah, exactly. I think you need, like, a lot of spectrum, because, like, if you only, like, if you're only doing, like, one kind of genre or something, like, that's not how real life works, you know, and from your day to day, you're going to experience a full spectrum and range of emotions, so if you only try to, like, capture one thing in all your work, especially if it's narrative-based, you know. And I think that's why, like, horror movies and stuff suffer a lot is because they, they only try to, like, you know, play on the fear factor, but, like, there's other things that happen, you know, throughout the day that, you know, tell the story of these people, and that's why, like, their characters fall flat and stuff. So I oh. think it's important to think about a spectrum when you're working. I mean, so, 
Um, not to interrupt you guys, but just real quick. Um, so we were talking about you know how sometimes a knee-jerk reaction in in concept design is to always put things in the foreground in the shadow, but you know you you can really play with things and and you know if you push things back far enough or whatever you can you can actually have your main character hit by um, by sunlight you know you know just by moving things around a little bit. And what's cool is like so you know this pillar here is giving us an indication of which direction the sun's coming from. And I mean clearly this other thing that's sort of in the middle ground now is is in shadow. And you know so you can you can bring in context that like okay just around the corner here on our right hand side there's got to be some kind of opening that's letting the sun again and that's what's going to be like an alley or something. Yeah, and that's what's hitting our, our main character here. Um, so once you do that, what I like to do too is this uh, method of uh, blooming the light source. And so you essentially are creating an alpha channel of your selection. And then you um, blur it. Unfortunately, I don't. Hold on. Oh, I didn't select it. Sorry. Uh, okay, so you you actually blur your selection, and depending on how much you blur it, the more bloom you'll get. There's a certain point that if you bloom it too much, bloom it too much, the selection will will um will will get corrupted, and you won't be able to actually achieve it. But um, doing saturation, so you you know you kind of brighten things up and. You can add more uh, warmness to the light source. Yeah, so. I mean, this is where we were before, and this is where we are now. And so, you know, you get you get this just really beautiful tones in there, like the sun coming through. And you can actually um, add more contrast to that selection if you wanted. And we'll do it in here too to see what what that does. I'm learning like so many new like modes watching you paint. <laughs> this is awesome. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I'm, that's what I'm here for, you know, to hopefully give people some tools. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're you're using the same thing I just described. You go into your alpha layer after selecting, and um, you blur it, and then you can start really playing with, uh, you know, how you want that light source to be explained. You can go over it again with more red or pink or and since this is a very limited color palette, you know, we'll keep things all pretty much in the same tone. Although I, I, I think this thing right here is just too 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 much the same. So I think shifting a little more to the purple might make it a little more interesting. Or blue. Yeah. And that's too purple. So what we'll do is we'll we'll bring it down. And that's actually need a little more red in there. Did you ever paint traditionally before you went to digital? Oh yeah, I mean I was I was um, traditionally trained uh, all through college, and right out of college is when, uh, which that was that would be two thousand one, circa two thousand one, and there, photo people were just starting to paint in Photoshop. I think Craig, Craig Mullins was hitting the scene back then, for, you know, in a big way. I remember my roommates and I huddling around a computer and we're like, "Oh my God, that looks amazing!" And how the heck is he doing it, you know? And, and now, you know, 15 years later, or so, you know, I look back at the work that I was blown away by, and it's still incredible. But then I go, "Oh, I I know how he's doing that. You know, I actually understand it." Yeah. It's just, you know, as a student starting out, you're just Mesmerized, it was like magic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we were all traditionally paint, uh, trained in oil, and acrylic, and gouache. And I think that's part of the reason why I like to use, uh, you know, a very opaque method to my to my art, because uh, it just reminds me a lot of acrylic and, and gouache. Just you know how you can lay down solid colors and really get some fast results. I actually felt like. I'm oh, sorry, are you get an idea. Yeah, it's echoing a little, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Nikki, you still make out what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, that's good now. 
Uh, I was saying, like, with the work that I've seen from you, I actually, like, felt like you were trained, like, traditionally. Like, it, I actually, like, thought it came through in, like, what you were what you were doing. So that was, like, I don't know. I, I thought that was actually, like, kind of fascinating. Because, like, like, you, you see a lot of people that, like, you know, paint digitally, and a lot of the stuff just looks the same. It's, like, super smooth, whatever. But, like, you have a similar kind of, like, a, a watercolor kind of... Uh, like watercolors meets oils, like I don't know, like 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 you're traditionally painting, literally. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I think that's you know that's the best use of digital is if you can try and, and look at it in a traditional way. As much as we're using filters here and every trick we can think of, <laughs> I mean, but yeah, if you can, you know, my my um, my method's always been to try and keep it as painterly as possible, especially for my per personal work, unless the client wants super texture, you know. Um, I just finished, actually I'll show you, just finished this poster for a client, and it's uh, it's about as tight as I'll ever get when it comes to um, uh, paintings and stuff. Final poster assets. So. Oh, so, I mean, cool. so this is like, you know, things are still painterly. Uh, you know, when you get up in here, there's, you know, you can clearly tell things are being chiseled and painted into, and, you know, the, the, the clouds are still painterly, but I'm using photographs in other areas, you know, using texture for the, um, you know, for all the stonework. Uh, you know, I, I actually took a giraffe, and then I re redesigned it into an alien giraffe, <laughs> and, and um, you know, it's still painting in my own bird. I mean, you know, so... Yeah, you know, I'm clearly using photography in a very painterly way, but you know, when you pull back, it doesn't feel very painterly. I mean, it kind of does. It's photography painterly. <laughs> I mean, this is the type of work that I prefer not to do because it's just too tight for me. It's just, I mean, I mean, it's 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 gratifying. It's you know, but it's just um, it's just fun to feel the art as you're as you're creating it rather than mechanically trying to, you know, finish every little corner. A real place. I think a lot of artists prefer that. I see that a lot in people's portfolios. These super tight environments, and they're so loaded with texture. And you know, I, I think it's a good, uh, good to remember the balance of, you know, of, of detail. You know, something very far away in the background can be very loose and indicated, and something like right here in the foreground, you know, can have. Um, you know, all these little tiny gears and details and stuff. But um, but the farther back you go, I feel like the more you want to just rely on on the feeling of what it is rather than truly explaining it. And, and I, I think, think that's... Think that's uh, sorry? Uh, uh, I was just I was saying, just like, saying I, like, I like... You're going to... Yeah, sorry, man. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah, I was saying, like, uh, that, that kind of ties into optics, too, because, like, um, you know, the further things get away, the more they kind of leave focus. So, right. Like... No, I totally... Um, I think one thing that uh, was... Uh, I, don't, I don't know, like, one thing you said about, like, you know, like, keeping things very, like, very painterly... And I think I think that's something that people tend to forget, especially now where everything gets like super photorealistic and whatnot, is that you know, reality there's only so far you can go before like you blend in with reality. But the thing about reality is reality isn't a painting and you're actually making a painting. So the fact that you're making a painting, it can actually like you can bring something a little bit more to that sense of reality that reality itself can't actually get. Yeah. I mean, right. In the real world, you know, it doesn't look like this. There's, you know, buildings aren't just blobs of paint. And, uh, but if you can, in your painting, get the viewer to believe that they're in this place, then that's that's escapism at its finest, you know, and that that's okay. I just think that the industry right now is so overloaded with hyperrealism just because of the technology. I mean, th these projects are VR related or you know, high end feature films. They're they're so um, demanding on detail because you know, these actual places and, and characters and things that, that are in these films are, are detailed. 
and they need and these concepts need to convey that in I you know video games whatever and uh, and that's that's important and that's great and I'm 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 totally willing to to go there uh, as all all of us are it's just you know I think I, I wish there'd be more projects and I th and I think that's why animation is so attractive to me in tr not animation in terms of animating I just mean animated projects like animated movies because um, the concept development side of things is actually the reverse. You know, it's more based on style and um, mood and and design in a very unique, creative way that's um, that's artistic and not essentially driven on on just the mechanics of, of what it is. You know, so it just depends on, on as, as an artist what you prefer to do. So. Um, anyway, let's see. I honestly get a little tired of seeing the the photo real stuff. Like I mean, like like I say, you see everybody do it so much, and like that. That's honestly why I cling back to like the old like anime two tone stuff that I like grew up with, just because you know not everybody does it, you know, and every, when you get into the movie and video game industry, it's just I don't know. You you don't you don't want to. You want to feel like you could bring something new, like with your work, and when everybody's doing the same thing, like you try, you you tend to. Uh, I've always like kind of veered away from like the the trend stuff. Good, that's that will set you apart. So I, I don't know. I think that's just. Yeah, I, I completely agree with. Yeah. Approach. Yeah, that's good. Um, all right, so. I don't know. There's. I mean, I could keep going, but you know, then we. I'm going to be boring for some people, I think. So I mean, it's just. I mean, at this point, I am clearly in a place where I've laid out my my painting in a very rough way. I've kept the the color palette pretty much the same, and you know, I've started to indicate structural details. Um, Design is out the window. I'm, <laughs> oh, there's no design going on right now. There's just like literally uh, an exploration, and and that's kind of why what, what you wanted me to do in the first place is focus on color palette and uh, you know limited color palette, and and that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is and, and lighting and composition, and and I think you know I've I've sort of explored that. Um, but, uh, I mean, you definitely have. Like, we really appreciate you just like you know, kind of yeah, running through like this stuff. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I hope those tools uh, help you guys out. I, I think you know those those uh, those filters, especially uh, camera raw filter, is a very important one and um, one that I, I if I'm in a bind and I'm having a slow day, you know, it's it's a great one to just pull out and just get you get you more jazzed about your piece. Because uh, you can mess around with color really quickly, and you know it's funny. You know, if you painted traditionally, in order to do that, you'd have to do like three or four mini little color keys. This was all being color key mode. You know, we used to like we'd do a little mini sketch, and then we would photocopy it, and then using um, uh, uh, matte, I think it's a uh, matte um, matte paste, and you would uh, you would brush your your photocopied thumbnails onto illustration board. You let it dry and then you'd have the same exact, you know, multiple copies of the same composition and you just test out all these different color and, and lighting options. You know, you don't need to do that anymore digitally because you're, you're literally doing it on the fly as you work. And I think that's a great advantage because you're still working on the final piece but you're working into the color key mode while you're doing it. So, anyway, yeah, hopefully I, this, this uh, helped you guys out. Oh, big time. Like, uh, there's a lot of things I'm going to experiment with now. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, uh, I would love to stay a little longer. I just have to pick up my daughter here. Um, but, I mean, before I leave, is there any, was there any questions or anything else you guys wanted me to, to go over? Uh, not specifically, man. Like, you know, we, like, like I said, we just appreciate you coming on here and kind of running through the demo with us and stuff. And, you know, it's always good to, always good to hang out with you. Yeah. I, I, likewise, I, I would love to do it again. If uh, if the time if the if the moment comes up, so oh definitely man, I mean, definitely. I only guess the 
I guess we'll wrap here then. Um, thank you again, Matt, for, for coming on and, you know, sharing your, your knowledge with us and showing us the demo and everything. Like, that's that's phenomenal. Um, yeah, and... Uh, watching, don't forget to check out Matt's site. Uh, is it mattgazer.com? Yeah, and uh, uh, M-A-T-T-G-A-S-E-R.com. And uh, look at his book, Fantastical. Really awesome book. Uh, a lot of great artwork in it. You know, if you're if you're definitely interested in his style, give that a look. Um, other than that, we'll be seeing you guys next time. Yep, see you next time, everyone. The concept development side of things is actually the reverse. You know, it's more based on style and um, mood and and design in a very unique, creative way that's um, that's artistic and not essentially driven on on just the mechanics of, of what it is. You know, so it just depends on, on as, as an artist what you prefer to do. So. Um. Anyway, let's see. I honestly get a little tired of seeing the the photo real stuff. Like you I mean, like like I say, you see everybody do it so much, and like that. That's honestly why I cling back to like the old like anime two tone stuff that I like grew up with, just because you know not everybody does it. You know, and every when you get into the movie and video game industry, it's just I don't know. You you don't you don't want to. You want to feel like you could bring something new, like with your work, and when everybody's doing the same thing, like you try, you you tend to. Uh, I've always like kind of veered away from like the the trend stuff. Good, that's that will set you apart. So I, I don't know. I think that's just. Yeah, I, I completely agree with. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, all right, so. I don't know. There's. I mean, I could keep going, but you know, then we. I'm gonna be boring for some people, I think. So I mean, it's just. I mean, at this point, I am clearly in a place where I've laid out my my painting in a very rough way. I've kept the the color palette pretty much the same, and you know, I started to indicate structural details. Um, Design is out the window. I'm like, <laughs> no, there's no design going on right now. There's just like literally uh, an exploration, and and that's kind of why what, what you wanted me to do in the first place is focus on color palette and uh, you know limited color palette, and and that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is and, and lighting and composition, and and I think you know I've I've sort of explored that. Um, I mean, you definitely have. Like, we really appreciate you just like you know, kind of yeah, running through like this stuff. Lot. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I hope those tools uh, help you guys out. I, I think you know those those uh, those filters, especially uh, camera raw filter, is a very important one and um, one that I, I if I'm in a bind and I'm having a slow day, you know, it's it's a great one to just pull out and just get you get you more jazzed about your piece. Because uh, you can mess around with color really quickly, and you know it's funny. You know, if you painted traditionally, in order to do that, you'd have to do like three or four mini little color keys. This would all be in color key mode. You know, we used to like we'd do a little mini sketch, and then we would photocopy it, and then using um, uh, uh, matte, I think it's a uh, matte um, matte paste, and you would uh, you would brush your your photocopied thumbnails onto illustration board. You let it dry, and then you'd have the same exact, you know, multiple copies of the same composition, and you just test out all these different color and, and lighting options. You know, you don't need to do that anymore digitally because you're, you're literally doing it on the fly as you work. And I think that's a great advantage because you're still working on the final piece, but you're working into the color key mode while you're doing it. So, anyway, yeah, hopefully I, this, this uh, helped you guys out. Oh, big time. Like, uh, there's a lot of things I'm going to experiment with now. <laughs> cool. Cool.
Well, uh, I would love to stay a little longer. I just have to pick up my daughter here. Um, but I mean, before I leave, is there any, was there any questions or anything else you guys wanted me to, to go over? Uh, not specifically, man. Like you know, we like, like I said, we just appreciate you coming on here and kind of running through the demo with us and stuff. And you know, it's always good to always good to hang out with you. Yeah, I, I likewise. I I would love to do it again if uh, if the time if the if the moment comes up. So. Oh, definitely, man. I mean, definitely. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll wrap here then. Um, thank you again, Matt, for for coming on and. You know, sharing your your knowledge with us and showing us the demo and everything like that's that's phenomenal. Um, yeah, and, and uh, watching. Don't forget to check out Matt's site. Uh, is it mattgazer.com? Yeah, and uh, uh, m a t t g a s e r dot com. And uh, look at his book, Fantastical. Really awesome book. Got a lot of great artwork in it. You know, if you're if you're definitely interested in his style, give that a look. Um, other than that, we'll be seeing you guys next time. Yep, see you next time, everyone.